Um, what I wanted to do with a seminar series when we first started was, was to address caregivers and what the issues are because we so often focus on the patient and you all do all the heavy lifting. Um, so we put these programs together. The three people we have here tonight um, have very different specialties and have been very involved in taking care of patients. Um, Mary Spangler is a nurse. She has also been a personal caregiver uh, in her own family and she's going to talk about that. Um, we have a gentleman here from CARA uh, whom I have dropped off materials for for what three or four different times. It was the first time we've ever really met uh, Jim Mulvaney. And then we have a dietitian whom I just met tonight who's over here to help you with nutrition and how to take care of yourselves as well. And you're going to have to introduce your first name because I can't remember it. My name is Jennifer Anderson. Anderson, I could remember, not Jennifer. So please don't hesitate to ask questions when this is over. They're each going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes. And you'll notice there are no slides. There's none of that stuff. It's just conversation. And then the rest of it is up to you and back and forth and help each other out, OK? And if you have any suggestions for other programs, please let me know. It's all yours. I don't know who's going to go first, but you choose. Well, it's good to be here with you tonight. Uh, working with caregivers, uh, especially family and friend caregivers of someone who is a terminally, has a terminal uh, diagnosis is how I got into this whole area with CARA. CARA is an organization that provides emotional support for those who are bereaved, as well as for those who are dealing with end-of-life situations. And our end-of-life clients include uh, those who are dying themselves, the caregivers for those who are dying, as well as the loved ones of those who are dying. And we provide support, both one-on-one -on -one counseling, as well as some group uh, kinds of support. So before I talk too much about this, I'd like to get to know a little bit about you. They, they said you couldn't ask any questions, but they didn't say anything about me. So I'd like to just take a moment uh, for you all to just reflect and think about some of the greatest challenges that you have as caregivers. Now, if there's someone here who is not a caregiver who may be the re recipient of caregiving, think about what some of the greatest challenges are for you. And just take a moment to do that. You probably don't have to think too hard about it. <clears throat> so uh, anyone who would be willing to just call out some of these challenges that you find particularly challenging. Anyone have something to share? Sure. Yes. Constant needing to be on call and not having any time for myself. Yes, very common one. How many can relate to that one? <laughs> OK, has someone else? Some other challenges that you find particularly difficult? Yes? One of the things that uh, I'm a caregiver, so one, one of the things I find kind of difficult is telling others, see, the, the person I'm caring for is my wife. And the thing is, she does not hear the word cancer or seeing anything Mm -hmm. So then you have to kind of figure out how do you want to tell them attack, you know, tell them to shut up. Yes. So how to communicate with those who are good-hearted, good-naturedly, right. wanting to help you out, but they're just inundating you with suggestions that really are not necessarily that helpful. Yeah. And how can you do that without ruining the relationship? Mm -hmm. Another big challenge. And that can happen between the caregiver and the one who's receiving caregiving, can it? That's a big challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Any other challenges? multiple and demanding hats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you're a family and friend caregiver, you may also be working, you may be caring for children, uh, and you have other responsibilities. And then in addition to that, there is the caregiving. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, having multiple roles, not just the caregiving role, but several others, each of which are demanding in and of themselves. Yeah. Yes. How do I handle my own emotions? Now, especially this comes up, uh, well, it comes up in any case, but uh, it comes up in a major way, caregiving for a terminal 
uh, patient or client or loved one. Uh, because there you, there's really uh, hope ha changes uh, its definition, what is hopeful. Uh, with someone who is terminally ill, you know, both the person who is ill as well as a caregiver, that this is likely to get worse and worse. It's, there's not really a solution. We're not going to necessarily get out of this in that way. So it's hard to deal with the emotions that come up around that. Well, I think we've, we've gotten a few ideas, uh, a few feedback here, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to address some of this as we go along. So I want to talk about three pillars of caregiving. You might wonder, well, only three? Well, <laughs> I'm talking about uh, the caregiving in the context of self-care. So I'm not talking about so much the skills that I may need to care for another <clears throat> in terms of the physical skills, the logistics, and so forth. I'm talking about more the emotional part of it. How do I take care of myself uh, through this? So uh, the first pillar is compassion. And before I go further, I'd like to just uh, give a little bit of a definition uh, of how I'm using compassion, because that can be different from one person to another. So compassion is feeling and experiencing with another, without judgment or agenda. It is characterized by an intimate, vulnerable joining with the other, without needing to make it better or change it. It is not pity which separates ourselves from others. So given that that's the, the nature of, of compassion that I'm talking about, <clears throat> One thing that uh, I've experienced is that compassion is a natural human quality. We really all have it. But we don't always experience it. There are things that get in the way of our natural compassion. So uh, another question for you. What do you notice gets in the way of your natural compassion? Yes. Fear. Fear. Yes, that's a big one, isn't it? Fear of all kinds of things. Fear of what may happen to the patient, fear of something happening that you can't handle, fear of making a mistake, fear of what will happen in the future. All kinds of fears. Thank you. What else? Chores. Chores. Just being so busy that it, it robs yourself of, of, of even a, a connection, a time to connect with yourself and perhaps even to connect in a very personal, intimate way with the one you're caring for. Thank you. One here, and then we'll go to the back. Exhaustion, physical and emotional. Mm. We can get to the point where, you're, where we're so overwhelmed, so exhausted, that there's no energy for me to, to do anything or even think about anything. Yes. Yes, yes. And if I can't be myself, I'm not even home to be compassionate from. I'm checked out somewhere else worrying about these kinds of things. So it's important to recognize that we all have this compassion. And there are things which get in our way. So now, what do we do about that? And we're talking here about compassion for ourselves, uh, not just for the one that we're taking care of. <clears throat> So I'd like to uh, refer a little, the next pillar, actually, is um, kindness towards self. Now, do you all have the handout called kindness towards self? Because I'll be referring to that. Perhaps you can hand them out to those that don't have them. So kindness, we usually think about kindness. That's something I do for you, right? That's how we've all been taught. That's certainly how I've been taught. I don't often think about it in terms of being kind to myself. That would be selfish, and there are all kinds of other thoughts that I might have that get in the way of that. And yet, to really give myself good self-care, I have to be willing to notice what is kind and notice what is not kind, and to give myself the kindness I need. So uh, the first section here <clears throat> is unkindness towards, towards self happens through how we do this whole bunch of things. And that's not an exhaustive list, but it's a good place to start. So things like how I schedule my time, how I push my body 
by not getting enough sleep, uh, by pushing too hard, by not getting help when I may need it. This is a big one. Uh, how I compare myself to others and I come up short. So I see how someone else may be doing with caregiving and I immediately start to become very self-critical. Okay, that's not very kind. How I su surrender to too many demands and make too many commitments, really beyond my capacity, and then I end up being so exhausted, I can't be really effective at just about anything. How I take things personally, okay? Uh, I find that most of the things, most of the situations where I take something personally, it has nothing to do with me. So I may be in a caregiving situation where uh, my client is uh, perhaps uh, angry. And if I take that as, okay, there's something I'm doing wrong. I've said something or done something that has upset the client. Uh, if I actually take the time, if I'm conscious enough to notice that, and I take the time to check it out, uh, which I've gotten pretty good at practicing doing that, most of the time I find this has nothing to do with me at all. And yet when I take it personally, uh, it, it handicaps my ability to really be there to support the other. Are you recognizing any of these or just uh, is this only my stuff? <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> uh, some others here. <clears throat> um, th this is a, a big one. How I disregard the signals of imbalance over a long period of time. Any of us can push through an emergency, okay, that's limited in time, but re what really debilitates us is when we continue at full throttle and, and because we think we must, uh, which may or may not be true, but we'll get to that later, but we think we must, so we're at full throttle and it's, we just guaranteed sooner or later of burning out, getting exhausted, getting resentful. Okay, and resentful is something that I find is a good barometer for how I'm doing. When I start to notice I'm experiencing resentment, I know I haven't given myself sufficient care. You know, it's directly related. So that's a, a good thing to keep your eye on is your resentment. Not to feel guilty about and criticize yourself about, but simply to use it as a signal to know, okay, I'm feeling resentful lately. I'm not taking care of myself. <clears throat> <clears throat> this uh, last one on that list, <clears throat> how I neglect to notice and to question the truth of my beliefs and expectations that are causing me to suffer. This is huge. If I could just make some inroads on this, I could really uh, get myself some relief, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Okay, moving on to, well, now that I can see some of the sources <clears throat> of how I am unkind to myself, what can I do to be kind to myself? Leave time for the quietness of simply being present with myself. And we all have ways of doing that, <clears throat> whether it's to take a walk, listen to music, meditate, any number of ways we do that. But often in a stressful caregiving situation, we don't give ourselves the time. <clears throat> Practice noticing when I am wanting things to be different than the way they are. That's another huge one. <clears throat> when I look at it logically, it just doesn't make any sense. I can't do anything about this, and yet uh, uh, when I'm wanting it to be different, it's making me feel really bad. And it's taking my attention away from my own self-care and perhaps even my care for the one I'm uh, caregiving for. One thing I want to uh, bring up is, um, does any, has anyone heard of Byron Katie? Raise your hand if you've heard of Byron Katie. We have one in the audience. Uh, Katie has uh, developed a little tool called, she calls the work, and it's a little, I would call it a meditation or inquiry tool that simply asks some questions about what I'm believing in this moment that's causing me so much suffering. Uh, so I have a little uh, note here 
where you can get some more information about that. But it starts off, and I won't go through the whole process because we don't have time right now, but it starts off with the question, is it true? Simple question, very profound. Profound because I rarely take the time to question anything I'm believing. I assume what I'm believing is true. So I never even get to that question. And yet here's another experience I've had thousands of times. I find that 90% of the time, what I'm believing, what I'm expecting, what I'm thinking, is anything from inaccurate to completely untrue. And yet these thoughts and beliefs are causing me a lot of pain and suffering, taking a lot of my energy and distracting me from what I could actually do that's more effective. Here's another one. Uh, often in a caregiving situation, we are not just holding what's going on in this moment. We're holding what went on in the past, and we're holding what might go on in the future. So that takes us out of the present moment. It adds to our suffering and distress. So one thing to be kinder to yourself is to do just what has to be done right now. Just right now. Because that's all that can be done. And I really like this one, number five. Let go of the belief that you should be able to control the stormy situations of your life. Okay. Somehow, uh, I don't know if you're the same as me, but I, I think I should be able to manage all of this stuff. And perhaps even on my own. Okay. Uh, definitely not true in a caregiving situation, is it? Because these, these, these demands of caregiving uh, can be so overwhelming. Uh, that uh, this kind of belief, this kind of expectation will really cause me some suffering. I just want to uh, wind up my segment. We can deal with questions and so forth in the, pat in the last segment. But uh, if you turn the sheet over, there's just some perhaps helpful thoughts, and I'd just like to quote a couple of these. First, fully accepting what is true in this moment is the only firm ground from which to make changes in your life and to heal. When I'm not in that place of accepting what's actually here now, I have no traction. I have no empowerment. And back to the theme of compassion for ourselves as well as uh, the person we're caring for. This is from the book Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. The internal work and the external work of caregiving are the same. The more you can develop the internal ability to be a calm, compassionate presence toward yourself, the more you can bring that presence to everyone you serve. Another one that I find very helpful, especially when I'm feeling that I don't have enough. I can't provide enough to support someone uh, that I'm caregiving for. This is from Out of Solitude by Henry Nowen. The one who can be present with us in our hours of grief, who can tolerate not knowing and face with us the reality of our vulnerability, that is the one who gives us our best caring. Thank you. So it's all mine. The floor is mine. So um, I'm Mary Spangler. I'm actually in charge of the employees at these two institutions, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and Stanford. So I've been very interested in resiliency. What is it that makes a person resilient? A nurse who's worked in the ICU for 30 years, how is that, how is that possible that person comes to work and deals with death and dying? Um, is able to do that and go home and have a, a great life? Or how about the family is somebody who, you know, who loses a loved one or loses a child, and I, and I watch them go on and live great lives. Like, what is it that makes people resilient? So that topic has fascinated me for a long time. Um, and I have my own personal story, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and what's worked for me may not work for you, but I think we all share um, a common bond when we're a care provider. Um, my husband was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is bone marrow cancer, in 2000. 
Um, and at that time, he was 44, um, quite young for that diagnosis. So I don't know if any of you out there have suffered through that problem of not getting a proper diagnosis. And we had uh, young twins who were nine, and my oldest was 13. Um, and at that time, I mean, of course, that rocked my world completely um, and trying to figure that out. And they gave him a 40% chance of living about three years. Um, he survived 13 years. And many of those years were incredibly rough, um, particularly the last two. Um, and so my story, he passed away July 4th. Um, and so my story is a little bit retroactive because um, I can look back on the times where things were working out pretty well and some of the times they didn't, weren't working out at all for me. <laughs> and so I hope that some of that will help you. Um, personally, I used to get completely irritated when people would say, Mary, you need to take good care of yourself. And I'd go, what does that mean? You know, I'm working, I've got three kids, I'm trying to keep the family together, my husband is sick all the time. How, what does that mean? I eat, I sleep, um, I exercise, and can I ask for anything more? And um, my word of advice on that is to try to figure out what floats your boat and, and make time for it. And for me, um, what, what retroact, I can, I can figure out now that my, my daughter uh, loved horses and that was a big love of my own. And I can think about how much I immersed myself in that. Um, I volunteered, I used a lot of my free time to be around the horses and, and do that. And it was incredibly fulfilling. I mean, I, not only was it a love of mine, I just love the smell of them, um, but I, it was a social event for me. I, I made a lot of friends and uh, it was great. And when my daughter left for college, I found myself driving out to the barn, no horse, no daughter, and it was like, wow, this is really not working for me. So my, uh, something that really made me feel good, my time, uh, left, and I had to kind of go figure that out, and I went back into counseling, and they said, well, try to figure out a time in your life where you were pretty happy. What was it that you liked to do? And it was almost trying to rediscover myself, because I had put so much on hold, um, and it was interesting because I was able to put that time aside to do horsing because it was my daughter, right? That was an okay thing to do, but to do something just for me was not so much okay. Um, and I have, uh, over the last two years, um, my husband actually went into hospice, not once, but twice. Um, and we said goodbye many times, and that part, which I'm gonna come back to talk about, was very difficult for me. Are you here, or are you not? Are you going today, are you going in two weeks, are you going in five years? It's so difficult, because you have your life on hold in so many ways. And the only thing, um, which is true, the only thing you have is the present, and the only thing you can do is try to figure out how to nourish yourself now, today, regardless of the outcome. Um, and for me, uh, on the, the, the first time he was in hospice, and we were all saying goodbye, and he was given two weeks to live. That was two and a half years ago. Um, my daughter signed me up for a yoga retreat. And I thought, oh, can I really do that? She goes, yes, you need to have something to look forward to, Mom. So she signed me up for a Costa Rican retreat. And I, I found myself at the airport. My husband's still alive. And I'm thinking, this, isn't, this, this doesn't feel right, right? I'm going off to Costa Rica. I knew nobody. Um, and I thought, this is really stupid. Well, this is really a mistake. But I went, and here we are in the circle in Costa Rica introducing ourselves. And the only thing I could say was, my name is Mary Spangler, and my husband's dying of cancer. And I started crying. And that was really my identity at that point in time, was I was the caregiver, 100% caregiver. I was also working, which was a good thing to do. Um, but I had kind of let myself my inner self go. I, I was just kind of waiting. I was in this holding pattern is what I called it. I was just circling, 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 kind of is it now? Is it, when, it, when, is it, when, is, when am I going to be released? But in reality, I wasted a lot of time not taking care of myself. Um, so it isn't just eating and sleeping and exercising. There's something that must give back to you. It's not getting a massage. It's not going to the movies. But it's something that gives back to yourself and figuring out what that is. And you know, for me, it was hiking and piano playing. I just took up an old habit, a whole hobby that I loved. Um, and there was a, a Yale study that was done and found that those people who are able to keep up with their hobbies and, and those who continued to work, which I did, and I'm thankful for that, um, actually were better caregivers. They had more to give. 
Um, so that idea of the person being at home and being there 100% of the time and not doing anything else may actually not put you in the best spot to be the caregiver because it does create a lot of frustration. And it was so hard for me to figure out what gave back to me, but that was a whole thing in itself. Um, at, at one point, I, I was really frustrated, and I, I reached out to a friend of mine who had also recently lost her husband. Um, and she said that, um, are you feeling guilty? And I, and I started listening to the conversations I was having in my head. And you know, I was feeling guilty that I was the survivor. I was going to be the survivor. And my poor husband, who I loved dearly, was going to die. And so the whole thing was about his dying process. And she got me to understand that that's two separate realities. His reality is that, yes, he, has to, he is going to die. But my reality is I need to figure out a way to live. And that is the process that I hope I can leave all of you with, is you need to figure out a way to be a resilient liver. How, what is it going to take for you to feel that your life is fulfilled even when you're a care provider? And that is just such a hard job to do. But that is taking care of yourself. It's not the day-to-day -day things. It's really figuring out what enriches your own souls. And, and, and then just grasp onto that and make time to do that. So she sent me this card. And I just want to read that to you because it was just so, so big for me. It said, relax. You are enough. You have enough. And you do enough. Um, and I thought that was really powerful for me at that time because I was just suffering, feeling I, 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 I'm not. I was doing everything I could, and I felt it wasn't good enough because he was still going to—he was still dying. He was still the one suffering, and uh, that kind of enabled me to spend a little bit more time on myself, which I thought was really good. Um, I know you addressed compassion, but I, I'm actually taking a class um, by the Stanford Sea Cares, and I don't know if any of you know about it. It's about cultivating compassion. Um, and it's actually funded by the Dalai Lama, and his head translator uh, runs a program. It's a fascinating program. And in that, they talk about the difference between empathy and compassion. Because I remember one day saying to somebody, I feel like my compassion tank is just empty. It's dry. I don't have any more to give. And they said, I think you've mixed up compassion and empathy. I said, well, what's the difference? Well, empathy is being able to relate to the feelings and putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. So. Victor was in pain, he was suffering, um, and he was scared about dying. And I was putting myself in those shoes. And, and that actually is exhausting uh, to do that. And you don't really have to do that as a care provider. What you have to do is compassionate, which is simply recognizing that someone is suffering and wishing that not to be so. Um, and that's really endless. It's boundless. There's nothing that takes a lot of energy. Um, but the empathy part has a lot, takes a lot of energy. And I don't know if anybody else can feel the difference between those two, but if, if I could relive my caregiving days, I would see the difference between those. Because one is boundless giving, and it doesn't, it's not exhausting, and the other one is just exhausting. And it's filled with so much guilt because you really aren't the one suffering. Um, and, and you can feel it. So it, it creates just a lot more, um, takes a lot more energy. Um, and the other thing that somebody else taught me that I thought was really helpful, and I, I don't know if I can tell the story correctly, but there was a woman in the audience um, who had asked, she said, you know, my husband died two years ago, and I'm still so full of grief that I can't go forward. And because I was so interested in resiliency, you know, I was attending this group session. And the a person who was doing the lecture said, well, you know, there's things that we all love. And he goes, so he picked up this beautiful uh, statue. And he said, this statue is beautiful, and I love this statue. He said, but if I tried to hold onto the statue all the time, I'd be completely disabled. I mean, I, I couldn't put my clothes on. I couldn't eat. I couldn't groom myself. I certainly couldn't go out. He said, so we all have our loves in our lives, and we all have our losses. And you can revisit them. You can hold them and look at it and look at your loss and look at your sorrow. But you have to learn to put it down. Because if you don't learn to put it down, it will just disable you. And I thought that was just such great advice, too, because as a caregiver, you are so full of sadness sometimes. I mean, people say, how are you doing? And I said, well, I grieved for 13 years. So for me, I, I, I'm not grieving that much now. I mean, I watched the loss of the person I loved. I, I watched the suffering he went through. Um, and, and I learned to be able to put it down and see that that is the sadness, and that is my loss, and that it's there, but I don't have to carry it with me all the time. 
And I think the same thing goes true as a caregiver. You don't have to wear the t-shirt that says the big C on it all the time. Um, and, and I kind of did that for years. Like that was my identity. And I think that you are so much more than a care provider um, and that you have to put that care provider down once in a while and really live your life or experience yourself just as you as a person because that is your job as a survivor to live. And we only get one chance of it. I mean, it's not like you get two chances, go, I'm gonna do a do-over. You don't get to do that, right? So every day, I mean, I can tell you now that Victor is gone and, and I, I feel the immediacy of living every single day to its fullest because it, life is just so tenuous. You just don't know when your time is. So why waste it? You know, uh, I, I think we should all just really grab it as hard as we can. So um, I will leave you with the thing that I have not figured out, and that was that sense of time. I know it's important to be in the presence, but I suffered so much not knowing when the end was going to be. Uh, and trying to plan out my life, like, uh, you know, could I plan for retirement? Or what can I do next week? I mean, I bought tickets to the Bing concert series, and we didn't get to go once because he wasn't well enough. So hard to, to live that life that you don't fully control. And I'd be interested to hear back from you guys if you have any, any tips on that one. Because I, for me, that was the hardest part in the end, is trying to figure out where to place myself in the timeline. Um, and uh, the guilt part also, I mean, going out and having a great time, knowing that Victor couldn't come, that was just really difficult too. But I think the timing is the hardest part, was the hardest part for me. And I wish I had a good answer on that one, because I don't. <laughs> but, so that was it. That's, that's my story. Um, so both of those um, parts are quite moving. Um, so my part is um, just talking a little bit about energy. And um, so my, my name is Jennifer Anderson. I'm a clinical dietitian um, at Stanford. I work in both uh, clinics as well as inpatient with um, in the hospital. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about ways to... Um, have energy and increase your energy so that you can um, not only feel better, but be better able to um, accomplish all the things that you have to do. So um, being a caregiver, it's um, really time consuming. Um, it can be more than a full-time job. And um, with all the things to take care of between doctor appointments, um, filling prescriptions, um, managing symptoms, and all the other worries and concerns of life, it being um, focusing on your nutrition or what you're eating may be one of the last things on your mind. But I just want to um, talk to you a little bit about um, how, how having good nutrition and making good choices can actually help give you more energy so that you're, um, that you're able to do things better and have more balance in your life. So um, the first thing is um, not skipping meals. Um, so can anyone tell me um, what, what happens to them when they um, skip meals or um, go a while between eating? Anyone want to share? I get migraines. Migraines? That can definitely happen. Um, any, anything else? Grumpy. Grumpy, right. So feeling irritable. Faint, yes. So lack of energy. Um, so that's um, some of the reasons why it's important to um, to make sure that you are eating regularly. Um, and so for energy, um, for to prevent getting grumpy or irritable, um, headaches are common. Um, so those are some of the some of the reasons why it's important to eat. And one meal that. Um, tends to be forgotten or some people tend to skip is breakfast. So let's say if you were to have dinner around 7.30 at night and then, um, the, then the next, then you wake up at 7.30 in the morning, that's already 12 hours between eating, which is fine um, because while you're resting, you're not using as much energy and your metabolism goes down. But when you're awake, um, if you're not having something to eat in the morning, your metabolism isn't getting started, um, and it can really affect your energy levels. So I recommend having something to eat within an hour of waking up. It doesn't have to be very big, um, just even something small, just to kind of get your uh, metabolism going and get some energy. 
Um, so I usually recommend with um, trying to space your meals so that there's not too much time in between. So between two and five hours um, having something to eat. If it's a snack, then closer to two hours, meals about five hours. That's um, kind of a, a, an ideal time. Um, another thing is if you're skipping meals or if you're waiting too long between meals, what can happen is um, you're, um, you're not thinking quite as clearly. So you might um, get to the point where you're feeling starving and then um, decide to grab the closest thing or um, get something that's maybe not as healthy for you. Okay, the second thing, um, important thing is staying hydrated. So water is probably the best, um, well, it is the best way to stay hydrated. Um, there's other type of beverages that are, that are healthy as well, preferably um, non-caloric beverages. So like iced tea, um, or there's, there's a variety of um, beverages. And um, some, and milk is also one that has some good nutrition to it as well. Um, things that can um, really add up with calories and maybe not help you the most with energy is that, um, well, sometimes smoothies can be good for you, but it is it doesn't make you feel as full and it has a lot more calories than if you were to have the whole fruit. Um, so staying, um, staying hydrated is really important. Um, it can cause headaches as well, um, feeling... Um, fatigued or lack of energy. So it's good to carry some water with you or um, have it available. Um, because if you're going to different appointments, um, that's, or just even being busy throughout the day, that might be something that um, you might forget to do or, or not have as often. Um, another thing that can happen, um, and this is with caregivers along with many other people as well, um, so emotional eating. So eating in response to boredom, fatigue, tension, anxiety, depression, loneliness, or stress. The foods that tend to be um, chosen in, re in relation to emotional eating is more of the um, higher fat or sugary sweet foods or even um, salty foods. Usually they're high in calories and don't have as much nutritional value. Um, and with those types of foods, it really doesn't give you the energy that you need. Um, and even um, if it's too high in calories, um, it might actually make you feel tired. Or if it has um, too much carbohydrate or sweets in it, it can give you a little, little boost of energy, but then give you a um, kind of a crash and um, make your energy go down. Um, so with that, um, it can become a cycle. So if you're feeling that emotion, let's say if it's um, let's say if it's feeling stressed, and when you're feeling stressed, if if you've gone um, to have some, some chips when you're feeling stressed, it's more it's easy to get in that pattern of when you're feeling that stress, then being like, okay, chips sound really good right now. Um, so it's good to try to break that cycle. And by doing that, um, it's good to find out what that trigger is. So what kind of trigger is prompting you to feel that way? And um, instead of, um, once you identify that trigger, coming up with a plan of what you can do to, um, to create a new cycle, a healthier one. So um, taking a walk, talking with a friend, drinking some water, um, sometimes thirst and um, hunger have very similar um, cues. So if you feel hungry, it might actually be that you're thirsty. Um, so some other things that you could do um, instead of going towards eating if you're not hungry is um, playing a game, listening to some music, writing in a journal, or any other activity that, um, that you find um, pleasurable until the activity, until the urge to eat passes. Okay. The next important thing for energy is making sure that you're including fruits and vegetables in your diet. I'm sure you've heard that many times. Um, so with, with fruits and vegetables, there's not any particular um, fruit or vegetable that is one to have all the time. Um, it's good to have a, vari a variety. And the way to, to kind of um, think about fruits and vegetables is trying to get a variety of colors. 
Um, so all the different um, fruits and vegetables have different vitamins and minerals um, and fiber um, that can really help with energy. And with, um, with fruit, it doesn't have to be fresh. You could have, if you're going to, you can have canned or frozen or even dried fruit. Um, they all count. Um, so another thing is with, um, that's, that we all do from time to time is eating out. We're not always home when, when we're feeling hungry or need to prepare a meal. So, um, so with that, um, also being aware of, of energy and um, trying to pick foods um, that, that will help with your energy. Um, it, when eating out at fast food or restaurants, it tends to be um, higher calorie foods. And so it's, it's good to kind of have a plan because when you're having those high calorie foods or if you're um, eating the, the portions that at restaurants, they tend to be quite large, um, then you can feel very fatigued um, and even feel lazy or a lack of energy. So um, some, some tips with eating out. Um, grilled foods tend to be um, healthier. Um, trying to stay away from fi fried foods. Choosing foods that are less processed. And also watching the portion sizes. So um, rather than choosing like a, a lar like a com combination meal or a full meal, you could pick um, an appetizer and then um, having a side with that. Um, or also thinking outside the box. So um, there's kids' meals. Those tend to be have between like 400 and 600 calories. Um, senior meals, those tend to be smaller portions as well. So just some options to consider. Or choosing a la carte and having, um, having several items as well. Um, so with, with sides, um, it's also good to choose like a healthy side with... Um, with your meal. So rather than, let's say if you're gonna have um, a hamburger, rather than having a, um, having a, a large um, restaurant size hamburger, having like a single um, like hamburger with a healthy side. So rather than picking fries, you could pick either um, a side salad or some places have apple slices or other types of fruit or even um, some fresh vegetables with that. And choosing water or iced tea rather than soda is also going to help give you more energy. Um, so I also have some, um, the next thing is portable snacks and beverages. So sometimes with different doctor appointments um, or different things that you have to get done throughout the day, um, it might be around times where a meal time or um, where you don't have access to getting something to eat, or there might be longer waits than anticipated. So in those, in those situations, rather than waiting until you're feeling quite hungry and a lack of energy, bringing some healthy snacks with you can help. And I have, um, there's up in, the, up in the front, there's a list of tips of um, portable and healthy snack ideas, and it's in the green. So that can definitely help with, um, with having, bring something with you um, so that you have it available so you make um, better choices. Um, another thing that can really help with energy is balancing your meals. So if you have, if you were going to have just um, carbohydrates for a meal, you're going to have, um, it might give you a boost of energy and then initially, but then you, then you might have a crash. It's good to have, and then if you were to have protein and without any carbohydrate with that, um, what can happen is your blood sugar might go low. So having a combination, not only of, um, of protein with some source of carbohydrate, preferably whole grains, um, along with some healthy fats, that is going to give you the best combination for energy. Um, so with proteins, um, some examples of those, actually, um, maybe I should ask. Um, so what are some good sources of protein that you um, eat or that you know of? Yes? I often carry uh, thermos with you know, maybe 8 to 10 or 12 ounces of milk in it, mm -hmm. um, typically 1% fat. And I often will carry um, particularly cashew granola bars as a particular 
set of, of their products that I really like that are um, somewhat lower carb, not so sugary, and a little bit higher in protein. And the, the trick is to just not OD on this stuff. Right. <laughs> because, but it really is helpful to me in boosting my energy. It also helps with my migraines. Great. Right. So those are some great ideas. So portion control, um, also like with the, the apple and the cheese, you've got some carbohydrate. You've also got some protein. Um, so that's, that's a good combination. With um, the bars, those have a combination of grains as well as protein. Milk is also a good source of protein and it has some carbohydrate in it. So that's, that's definitely good. That those, um, those are definitely great snacks to carry. Does anyone else have any suggestions? Yes. Right. So the small cups of peanut butter, that's, that's a great idea. That's really portable. Um, and if you have it with some, um, if you have it with, let's see, either like a banana or if you have it with some graham crackers um, or apple slices, great. So those are also really easy ways to um, have some healthy ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Baby I'll, carrots are I'll great. Carry whole grain bread with a little bit of, in my case, some parsley butter because I'm avoiding um, nuts also. Uh, and baby carrots packed alongside that. The carrots just taste so refreshing and sweet. And the other is good protein. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I was thinking of, and I'm blanking on it now, but what it is. But, oh, Trader Joe's has. serving, but it's easy to treat it as two servings if you use a little bit of snack. And it's, it has vegetables, it has some chunks of chicken in it, it doesn't have mayonnaise, it does come with a dipping sauce that you can use or not, because it's pretty innocuous. Right. It's but it's just it's something that there's always a Trader Joe's around somewhere if you're on the move. Right. And actually... Um, and it keeps pretty mm -hmm. well, too. Great. Um, so the, actually, yeah, Trader Joe's, they do have, I'm, I'm not um, representing them, <laughs> but they do have some great um, meals to go there as well as um, I've noticed that there's, nuts are also a great snack. Nuts, they, um, they have some good benefits, good protein, good fiber in them, um, but they are quite calorie dense. So with nuts, it's good to make sure that you're not eating too much. Now, a serving is about a handful or about a quarter cup, um, but it's, it can be really difficult to just stick with um, a handful of nuts. So um, with that, there's either, I have noticed that um, actually at Trader Joe's, they have like some individual packets, um, which is really, really great. So you can either do that or you can um, just put them in a, like separate them in a snack bag um, so that you have individual portions to take with you. So great. So I think um, those are some good ideas and we also have some more at the front as well. Okay. And so with, um, so balancing your meals, um, the whole grains are preferred. So brown rice, whole um, wild rice, oats, popcorn, quinoa, barley, those are some um, some whole grains. Also with like breads, looking for whole wheat as the, the first ingredient. Um, and so the, some of the benefits of having whole grains over refined grains is that in, um, when they're refined, the, um, the fiber is taken out as well as the, the vitamins and minerals. So the whole grains have that extra fiber and they also have the vitamins and minerals. Um, and that's why it's, it's good to have the, the whole grains. Um, now with um, fats, it's good to have healthier flat fats. Um, we need a combination of protein, carbohydrate, and fats in our diet for um, a healthy diet and to make sure we're getting all of our needs. 
Um, so with, with, um, with fats, it's good to look for um, the healthier fats. So like the olive oils, the um, canola oil, um, some other good options are avocado. Um, that's a, another good um, healthy um, fat as well. Um, so those are just some examples and it's good to have a combination of those with, with meals or with snacks. And um, so then the last thing that I wanted to talk about is dinner suggestions that are um, fast and healthy. So I have um, at the, the front, there's also um, this blue handout with just some, some different um, suggestions on um, easy things for dinner. Um, eating healthy it doesn't have to be um, a complicated, long, drawn out thing. Um, there are ways to eat healthy without um, that are fast. And because with being a caregiver or um, even people who aren't caregiving, um, time is, um, can be precious and there, there's not always that much time to um, make meals like um, in previous generations. So um, some of the suggestions on here are like a spinach salad with chicken and fruit. Um, so you could even, I mean, you can put in the different types of fruit that you like. You could put in some nuts. Um, and then with like the chicken, you could even um, have uh, salmon instead of the chicken or adding some, um, some turkey or uh, there's just different ways that you can um, put them in combinations. Another thing is a whole wheat um, pita with vegetables. So you can just put in your favorite vegetables in the pita um, and then, well actually you can grill the vegetables first and then put them in the pita and that's, that's a good um, dinner. Um, and then also with um, another option here is like turkey sausage with spinach on whole wheat pasta. So you could also, um, Instead of having the whole wheat pasta, you could have some brown rice or, um, or other wild grains or quinoa. Um, and you could even switch out the, the turkey with um, another type of meat as well. And leaner meats are, are healthier as well. And um, Okay. Um, so does anyone have... Well, I guess we, we talked about um, not skipping meals, about making sure that you're staying hydrated, um, having some... Um, healthy snacks with you when you're um, going out, and then some healthy and quick dinner ideas with balancing meals. And so all of these tips together, they can help with your energy to make sure that you're really maximizing it um, so that not only will it help you um, have more energy to take care of your loved one, but also um, to take better care of yourself.